I'm, I'm excited that Deb is here because pollinators are one of my favorite subjects. Uh, Deb works for the uh, NRCS, the US State NRCS as a soil conservationist for the last 19 years. She helps landowners plan conservation projects and address natural resource concerns on their property. Um, and she'll tell you some more about how that could look. She has a BS in zoology and an MS in forestry. And her interests and professional focus areas include combining wildlife and forestry practices uh, to so that you're managing both for sound silviculture and optimum wildlife habitat, uh, creating early successional and bird nesting habitat, pollinator habitat creation, promoting small diverse farms, local food production, agriculture, promoting land conservation, environmental education, and in integrating all the resource concerns to create a balanced conservation system. Uh, I'm really glad you're here with us, Deb. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Juno, for the wonderful introduction. And I just wanted to um, thank CLC for having me, hosting me tonight, and all of these people that have come out um, on their Wednesday even, evening and giving up some time. Um, you're obviously great conservationists and great pollinator supporters. So thank you so much. And I'm thinking without further ado, we can get started. Let me share my screen here. And how's my sound? Everyone hear me okay? I see a thumbs up, thank you. Okay, here we are. Good evening again. I'm Deborah Marnich. I'm a soil conservationist with the US Department of Agriculture, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And for those of you who don't know what our organization is, we are a federal organization um, under the Department of Agriculture, and we help private landowners um, with federal cost share programs and conservation practices and projects on their property. And I have quite a few things to talk about tonight. So um, kind of buckle up and hang on for a crazy ride. We'll be jumping around from topic to topic, but I'm hoping that in the end, somehow this is all gonna meld together into one big picture. Um, some topics I wanted to touch on tonight were crops and pollination the importance of bees in that process, um, bees and habitat, natural pollinator habitat, pollinator habitat features, and also how to create pollinator habitat by seed or by direct planting with plants. So pollinators provide an ecosystem service that enables plant to produce fruits and seeds, very valuable service, about 70% of the world's plants require a pollinator. And 35 are crop species of those plants worldwide. You think about the different types of pollinators, we've got moths and flies, butterflies, wasps, beetles, and also bees. Bees are really actually the most important pollinators. And I can tell you why. Um, they, pardon me, let me get rid of that. Okay, let's go back a slide, shall we? Um, let's see, it's not really working, but bees are the most efficient pollinators because they exhibit flower consistency. They bring pollen and nectar back to the nest and they're feeding their young and they feed on the same flowers. So therefore they're pollinating them more frequently and they have a type of pollination where they use their abdomen muscles and they buzz on a flower and shake a flower and shake the pollen off of it. And um, they're very, very efficient pollinators. Um, let me see if I can backspace here. I'm not sure what happened exactly. I can't get back there, but um, 
I want to talk a little bit about native bees and how they are very efficient pollinators. Um, they are active early and later in the day in warmer temp in colder temperatures and lower light. Um, and they have the buzz pollination, like I mentioned. And there's no rental fees. Native bees can um, actually supplement honeybees if they're hard to acquire. Um, honeybees, kept honeybees are um, great at pollination. However, they're, they're subject to different types of mites, um, varro mites and tracheal mites and disease. And um, that kind of weakens their abilities at times. Plus they come at a higher cost. So when you think about pollination, if you keep bees, which I love honey and um, definitely, definitely a big fan. Um, if you're pollinating crops, you might want to think about using native pollinators to accent um, that pollination or accelerate that pollination process because they do fit in a very good niche um, around the kept bees with the longer hours and the different types of tactics for pollination. Um, unfortunately, native bees are in decline. There are four sister species of bumblebees, the yellow bandit, the Franklins, the rusty patch, and the western, they're all in decline. And um, increasingly rare um, bumblebee, the banded, yellow banded bumblebee is found in New Hampshire. They are high altitude nesters. As you can see, we're in the corner of Coas, Grafton, and Carroll County here, which would be the White Mountains. And they are high altitude nesters. They come very early in the season and require very early source of pollen. Um, and I think that's why um, the decline in habitat has kind of narrowed them down to only certain areas. And um, it's um, unfortunate, however, I'm glad they're still here and I'm glad they're in New Hampshire and in those three counties. Um, when we think about pollinators, we need to think about habitat that is surrounding, um, say, crop fields or what makes diverse habitat for pollinators. The number of natural areas in or on a property surrounding a property is a major influence on diversity and abundance of bees. Monocultures really just don't work. So we want to make diverse habitat. We want to create food, water, shelter, and resting areas. You'd like to provide flowers for the season, but especially in the early season, and manage for late blooms, hopefully into the end of November, if that's possible. Um, you want to mimic Mother Nature because that's how Mother Nature does it ideally looking for a span of almost nine months of flowering species, trees, shrubs, and plants. We wanna let the weeds go. Um, the things we classify as weeds are actually great native pollinator sources of food. So um, we wanna let that stuff go. Um, and like I said, mow fields late into um, the year, November, ideally the end of November and include mosaic mowing patterns and feathered edges, which I'll explain right now. Feathered edges are gradual, transitional, or safety zones between fields and woodland habitats. Um, it's a tra gradual transition zone that heads off into the woods, as you can see right here, and which allows animals to feed safely and escape or nest safely. This area provides important nesting, escape and cover for several declining wildlife species. It improves habitat for soft mass producing species. Um, it also improves habitat for flowering plants along the edge of a crop field. Uh, it increases light to the edges of the cropland. So improving yields as well in the cropland. Uh, farmers are always pushing back their woods to keep their fields the same size they originally were or expand them. So it's nice to have a feather edge control over that. And um, you should allow up to 50 feet um, for a feathered edge to be pretty effective habitat. Mosaic mowing, on the other hand, is a mowing method to leave clumps or islands or peninsulas as habitat. 
it's a different different way of thinking rather than just mowing an entire field straight down and keeping it in a monoculture of just grass. Um, you want to provide specific trees and shrubs for soft mass or flowering shrubs or trees to enhance that field habitat. Creating vertical diversity uh, within the field is fantastic. Different sizes and stages of plants really create a lot of nice diversity. Um, creating areas to seek shelter and nesting areas um, for ground nesters or even shrub nesters is really an ideal situation as well. Kind of just mixing it up in the mowing world. Um, speaking of diversity, I wanted to talk about um, a little bit touch on diversity in habitat and balance in nature. Um, this is a picture of a pollinator a garden we planted behind work actually is quite small. Um, it's not large at all. However, um, we let some native grasses come in for vertical diversity within the, the stand. And all of a sudden the dragonflies showed up and they were resting on these uh, vertical structures of grass and, um, and hunting. So it was a perfect place for them to, as a hunting perch. And so, um, dragonflies are beneficial predators. They're nature's pest control. And when you have a system that's complete, you have the top predators all the way down to the smallest ones. Um, so that it is all inclusive. And that's a great way to know that you have a good system going. Um, another example of nature's pest control is the brachnoid wasp um, and parasitism on tomato hornworm. Um, anyone who has a gardener who's grown tomatoes um, has seen these creatures, the tomato hormones. They are um, kind of scary enough on their own, but then comes along this uh, brachnoid wasp and lays its eggs on them and the larva will develop and um, eat the hornworm alive. So it's all like a gruesome horror story. However, it is nature's pest control. <laughs> And it's a good thing, we gotta have it. So I'm switching gears again. And when we're thinking about pollinator species, this is a great big picture chart that shows you, like I mentioned, on a nine month basis. However, we may narrow that down in New England to may say maybe seven months, ideally. Maybe from March or April into late November. These are examples of um, flowers and plants and trees and shrubs that may be blooming. This is um, caters a little bit more to a, a southern um, aspect. However, we do have a lot of these plants in this area. But my point is, um, you want to mimic Mother Nature. When, when you're choosing species to plant, you want the very early season spring, you want the late season spring, you want the early season summer, you want the late season summer, et cetera, et cetera, and so on until the end of November. So you can provide a food source throughout the entire, um, the entire season, basically. And as I mentioned, early flowering trees and shrubs are a very important food source for pollinators. Red maple, willows, hazelnut, service berries are all some of the very, very first um, trees and shrubs to start flowering out. Uh, this was a photo I took a few years ago and uh, I saw this bumblebee, this, I, I could smell this red maple blooming and it was just amazing. It was so sweet. And um, as I looked closer at it, I saw this bumblebee clinging to the bottom of this flower. And it was, it was kind of cold and drizzly and rainy. But as I mentioned before, the bumblebees and the native bees, they are able to operate in lower temperatures than kept honeybees. So they're a little hardier. But here he was, April 27th, hanging out on this red maple. And of course, our favorite lake and our favorite mountain in the background, uh, Chikora Lake and Chikora Mountain. Um, I took this picture two years ago. This is service berry, one of um, the very first flowering bushes around in the season. And it was uh, May 18th. And um, 
I drove down the road today and I saw a sourgrass berry in bloom. So um, just for a comparison, I think we're like two weeks ahead of where we were two years ago with spring. And um, due to rising temperatures, I think that's kind of what we're looking at. But um, just wanted to show you an example of the service berry, which is a great early season bloomer. And here I go switching gears again. I want to talk about habitat needs um, for ground nesters. They need bare soil. 70% um, of bees nest in the ground. It's kind of hard to believe because when you think of bees nesting, you think of a classic beehive or hanging from a tree or maybe a paper wasp nest hanging under an eave of your house or um, something hanging somewhere, a hornet's nest. Um, it's actually, the majority of bees nest in the ground um, and especially all the native ones, obviously. Um, they need bare soil. And if you ever come across an area that looks like this is just dotted with little holes, um, it's definitely bees nesting in there. And as you can imagine, soil disturbance and plowing and um, development, other things like that can really, um, can really just um, destroy the habitat for a nesting season for sure. Um, the rest of the bees, 30% of native bees nest above the ground. And these are the ones we know in the hornet's nest and the tree cavities. And a lot of native bees will nest in um, pithy stems like this bamboo. I mean, that's artificial, but raspberry is a stem that they will nest in as well. Um, and a lot of people provide artificial nesting structures for the above ground nesters. And this is an example of a landowner I worked with that made a nesting structure out of old scraps of wood, some pithy stems included, and wood pallets. And um, sure enough, if you drill holes into a block of wood, there's going to be a bee that nests in it, no doubt about it. And that's just a different angle of that. And this is in our pollinator garden at the office. UNH donated this to us. So we actually had some bees. You can see the, some of the holes are sealed up and they are nesting in there. So I'm switching gears on you again. And I wanted to talk a little bit, a little bit about the NRCS and how we can help out with cost share programs. Um, I see a lot of our, our landowners and our, um, our folks and our customers that have participated in our program are online tonight, and I'm glad to see that. So you're familiar with our programs, but I'm going to tell the rest of you all about the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. It's called our EQIP program for short. Um, it addresses resource concerns on private land and um, some of the practices we are able to address are pollinator practices, pollinator habitat creation, tree and shrub planting, uh, pollinator management plans, riparian buffer planting, wetland enhancement, no-till or strip-till in a crop system, and early successional habitat development. This is a project that we did that was just absolutely um, one of the best examples of a feathered edge. And as you can see, there's native grasses coming in here. Um, however, this is mostly Menard or bee bomb coming in at this point um, in the midsummer. And um, in this mix, and in a lot of um, pollinator mixes, they'll include a mix of flowers and seeds that will go throughout the season. And this is where we were midsummer with this one. Okay, so um, a lot of people may ask, how do you make a pollinator plot like that? Um, I'll tell you what, the site prep is the most difficult part. Um, the first season, um, it takes about, about one season or more to do site prep um, to remove competing grasses and whatever else would be growing there if you're starting from scratch. Um, so you'd have to do that. And I have a few tactics to do that that I'll share with you in a moment. Um, but once you do that and you get rid of, um, the, you do your site prep and you get rid of the vegetative growth on top because you need mineral soil to start from seed, okay? Um, you would seed the mix 
in the fall or early winter, okay? And that's kind of counterintuitive. People think of seeding and growing things and they think of spring, you know, and early spring and early summer. Um, this is how, if you think about it, in nature, when plants drop their seeds, it's always at the end of the season. Um, and then they winter over, right? So we're gonna mimic nature that way. And while the seeds are wintering over in the seed bed, there's freezing and thawing and expanding and contraction and seeds are getting worked into the soil. And they're just waiting for the spring to show up and they're ready to go. So the best time if you're gonna do a fall seeding for a pollinator planting would be right before a snowstorm. It'd be perfect. You just throw the seed down, let the snow sit on it, and it's gonna keep the seed where it is. And um, come spring, you'll be ready to grow. And for maintenance on a pollinator planting such as this, um, they're suggesting mowing annually with a high set mower to uh, reduce competition. Okay, um, let's roll into site prep. Um, solarization, it's one of my most favorite methods of site prep. Um, the key steps are you would, um, you'd mow and rake an area that you'd like to prep for a pollinator uh, planting. Get all the vegetative matter off of it. Um, use a greenhouse tarp or plastic and tarp down the area. Some people cultivate it. You can rototill it. You can do whatever to get the rest of um, the residual growth off of it. Um, and then for an entire season, for six or seven or eight months, an entire summer growing season, you could throw the greenhouse tarp over it, secure it on the edges, make sure it stays. The idea here is there are always um, seeds in the seed bed. And what you're gonna try to do is elevate the temperature so much that they're kind of cooked and they're not gonna sprout. You know, you've kind of killed them off. If they do sprout, they die. Um, you're kind of just, you know, sterilizing that area so that um, come fall, you can then remove the plastic and throw your seed down right before a winter storm and, and let it sit until the spring. Okay, here is an example of a field that was plowed in Carroll County and then solarized for a season. So the greenhouse tarp and plastic was um, on that area for an entire season. There are a bunch of high tunnels in this field, super high tunnels. So it was a good location, it's right next to the high tunnels. And come early spring, they seeded right before the first snowstorm. Come early spring, this is what came in. We got some bachelor's buttons and we also have some native grasses coming in here as well. This is a great, great pollinator planting with vertical diversity and native plants and also, you know, pollinator seed that's um, now flowering out in early spring. And as I mentioned, in a lot of seed mixes, um, there's a variety of seeds that will bloom and germinate and come to throughout the season. They're designed that way to have a flower blooming in every, at every single time. It's um, synchronized very nicely. This was a late summer. Um, as you can see, there's goldenrod coming in. There's black eyed Susans and different um, late summer flowers coming in at that point. Okay, I wanna move a little bit into seeding now. Um, pollinator seed is very expensive and it's almost always very tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, if you're gonna hand seed, you really have to bulk it up um, with like say play sand or a lower cost seed that's larger, maybe buckwheat or something like this. Although I would highly recommend play sand. I've had the most success with that. Um, and also, if you're seeding on your own and you're prepping the area that, like I mentioned, there really has to be um, mineral soil or some kind of seed to soil contact um, to get the germination going for these pollinator seeds. Also, a roller is suggested to compact and um, pack the seed right down into the soil. So A, it stays where it is. It's not blowing off or washing off in a storm. And um, creates more of a microclimate for it to germinate. Okay, uh, this is a um, seed mixture that I prepared at our office um, for the planning behind the office. 
and I use sand as a bulking agent. It's in a five gallon bucket. And uh, I think I ended up pouring more sand in it, but ideally, you know, you, you wouldn't want to see that much seed concentrated together. You'd want to see a little more, a little more sand. And this helps the sand bulks the seed so that when you disperse it, it's widely dispersed. It's not all right on top of each other because if the seeds are on top of each other, they're going to go tiny, tiny, tiny. So you want to give them their space and you want to use the bulking agent. Okay. Here we go with our little plot behind the office. And um, this, switching gears again, was actually a spring pollinator planting. We decided, oh, well, we, we, you know, we, we didn't get it together in the late fall, but we have time now. Let's do a spring planting. So what we did was rototilled this area and then raked it and um, free of all debris and then seeded it with the bulk seed and then we took a roller and rolled everything out. Um, rolling the seed, as I mentioned, is a must. It, it really is. It's just the last ingredient for success in your pollinator planting. However, there is one more trick. And in dry years, um, which happen frequently these days and these years, um, we're encouraging to use straw mulch. Um, we straw mulch this planting. And it, when, after we seeded it, I think it rained once and then it didn't rain for an entire month. So um, it really saved the entire planting. It, again, it creates a microclimate. It holds moisture, it holds warmth and creates germination, um, accelerates it and it ensures, ensures survival. Okay, this is the first year after our planting. It was really, really fun. And these are the aha wildflowers that come on the first year. Um, they're almost all annuals. The pollinator seed is made that way so that you say, oh my God, this was a raging success. And it makes you feel, these are the feel good flowers right from the beginning. Um, and it's great, it's perfect. Um, they move in to start with. The perennials will take a couple years to get established, but eventually, they start creeping in. We've got a little bit of Menarda there, the bee bomb. Um, there's some blanket flowers creeping in and a little more bee bomb there. Um, still quite a few black-eyed Susans. However, by year three, we've transitioned almost completely over to perennials. Um, we've got this, this Clintonia happening, the bee bomb. Another more blanket flower and um, a few sunflowers that I planted. We, I just wanted to mention, we also added some bird boxes in, in the background here to enhance this planting as well. And um, really goes along with it nicely as far as habitat. Tree swallows have occupied those boxes every year. So I'm not sure how many people here have larger farms, but on a larger scale, a conical tractor mounted seeder or a cyclone seeder works great for low cost seed mix like clover or buckwheat. Buckwheat is one of the best pollinator plants around. Um, if you plant it, the bees will come in just, in just hordes. And um, it's really nice and simple. You may wanna terminate it, it may reseed itself. Um, however, it's a great, great pollinator plant. And so is clover. Bumblebees love clover, especially um, purple clover, mammoth clover. Um, and as I mentioned, this type of cedar would be used for larger seed. It shouldn't be used for small expensive seed like the bee bomb or aster. Um, it's too tiny and it won't mix well in this type of cedar. It's hard to control um, the overseeding rate with just a few pounds per acre on it, so. But using a conical seeder, you could frost seed, which is a great practice. If you have a wet field, you can't get on it early. Go out while it's still frozen and um, you can frost seed clover. And um, it's a great nectar resource for pollinators. And it's also a nitrogen fixer for the soil. It's a legume and nitrogen fixer and it will improve your soil as well. Okay, here's another example of a spring plow down um, of sod. We chose to do a spring planting here because 
as you can see, the agricultural field next to this is um, relatively free of annual and perennial weeds. And if that's the case, I think a rototill and a light raking and, um, and a seeding right afterwards is, is sufficient enough to manage you know, weeds so that you actually get some, some pollinator species coming up. And again, this was um, two years after this planting. It's a beautiful feathered edge and um, it's late summer, early fall. We've got New England asters coming in here. Um, the bee balm has gone by, the cone flowers um, and, and other species have gone by as well. So that's kind of how it turned out. Um, NRCS has also done pollinator plantings in riparian buffer zones and riparian areas. A lot of our early season um, pollinator bushes and shrubs are found in wetland areas, willows, and um, again, sometimes the serviceberry and um, different species that will start very early in the year. Um, so riparian areas are a very good area to extenuate. Um, this is what you're doing here. This was a field along a river. They added some bird boxes also to enhance the habitat. And you know they're planting um, red osier dogwoods that will flower, but they will also provide berries later in the season as well. Um, species like this. This is up in Coas County. Okay, some general information about pollinator plantings. Um, they don't have to be huge. Um, on a large crop scale, they can be as small as a half an acre or smaller um, per 40 acres of crop to be beneficial. Um, they can fit on a smaller scale into farmscapes and landscapes um, in small or odd areas that you don't use that are kind of quote waste grounds. Maybe you got a bunch of stuff stored up in an area, the soils are sandy, they're poor, no worries because pollinator seeds are made to really germinate and exist in the harshest of conditions. And they do, they do. I planted um, from seed a uh, garden in my yard, which is just, just almost complete sand, atom sand and um, it came up beautifully. So for those tough to plant areas where you don't have to haul in seed, pollinator planting is a great idea from seed. And pollinator habitat creation on a much smaller scale can be you know, backyards, lawns, gardens, small fields. And you'll also, even if you're seeding a bucket like this, the seeds are so small, you're gonna wanna bulk it with sand as well. And it's just an example of a garden that I did in my yard. And these are perennial plants that I put in. And that brings me into this topic. This is an NRCS planting we did with um, pollinator planting with potted plants, which was great. Transition from seed into plants. And these folks decided to use some um, landscape fabric for weed control. However, you really don't have to. Um, as another NRCS pollinator planting with whole plants and uh, there was no weed control. And as you can see, natives are coming in like goldenrod and um, there's quite a bit of vertical diversity in here, which is really, really nice. Um, pollinator practice um, is something we can use alongside other NRCS practices. This is obviously a high tunnel um, that we planned for a landowner and they planted their strip right along the side of the high tunnel. Um, this area here is being grazed, obviously, um, if you can see the fence. So multiple things going on here and um, it's a nice practice to plant near or alongside a high tunnel. And here's another NRCS planting. This is actually a rolling high tunnel in the background. It was on wheels and um, it's movable. And the landowner decided to plant by seed, you know, a large field right next to 
the high tunnel. And I was out here, uh, this is in Carroll County. I was out here with the um, entomologist and he happened to point out to me, well, the whole field was a buzz. It was just amazing. This was early summer, but he happened to point out to me some feral bees that were showing up, um, honeybees in the field, which I've never ever seen before. And um, I just at that moment realized that um, it was something I had no clue about and they're here. They're in Carroll County and it just instantly made me think about how valuable um, this, this little plot was because somewhere around here in this neighborhood, there were feral bees, wild native bees, honeybees. And um, they're really on the decline, like 90% on the decline to 100%. And it's because of habitat destruction. So I was really just charmed to see how this turned out and um, it was really a neat experience. Um, this is a pollen planting dominated with poppies. This is down in the Malton Barrow area. And I think it was alongside a greenhouse or a high tunnel. I think they chose Vermont seed, wildflower seed source. And um, later on in the talk, I have some resources to share with you for seed mixes and seed sources. We can touch on that. Um, you're always experimenting with pollinator plantings, what works, what doesn't. Um, so the greenhouse in Carroll County where we planted an insectary strip and um, it was for pollination. It was actually inside the greenhouse for pollination and pest control, which I'm sure it did very well. However, um, it really kind of cut down the airflow on the sides and um, there, there were some mold issues. So um, we learned from this experience. Um, so um, probably outside the greenhouse is a better location for that. Um, this is a pollinator planting that's mixed in with high bush blueberries and a blueberry planting in a field. Um, I've seen this happen also with one of my landowners in an apple orchard. Um, he actually just seeded everything underneath the apple trees into a pollinator mix. And how clever was that? He got great pollination. He did not have to mow a single thing and um, he saved time and resources and got even better pollination than he's, you know, he's ever had. He was thrilled with it and said he would never go back to grass underneath his trees. So although it's been so much fun, and this is one of my favorite topics that I can talk about on and on and on, um, I am going to leave you with the very first take home message of the night um, that I'd like to impress upon you. A diverse community of wild native bees can provide significant pollination for many different crops, as we've seen. Um, habitat can support wild pollinators, as well as managed and native honeybees. And we want to plant diverse forage patches, create nest sites and habitat, and leave refugia and mimic nature. Try to include the plants that are early bloomers, their mid-season bloomers, their late season bloomers, and try to create the whole ecosystem. And also farm bill conservation programs can be used to support conservation of pollinators as well. And it is. My second take home message for the night is that pollinator habitat is mutually beneficial habitat for all creatures. Um, if you plan it, they will come. And I mean everyone and everything. So habitat for one is habitat for all and everything is always connected. You absolutely cannot do one thing without affecting something else. And um, if you're aware of that, it can be a great outcome. Um, I just threw this slide in. These are some critters that I have photographed in and about my yard, um, in and about my pollinator garden, some of them. And I just wanted to say again that, um, you know, build it and they will come in all shapes, sizes, and forms um, from hummingbirds to the praying mantis, which I was pretty excited about. I've really never had one of those in my yard before um, to the, um, the Eastern newt or the red eft and also this um, tiny little tree frog who 
took up residence on our hammock and um, I warned my husband that we'd have some stiff competition possibly for the summer for the hammock. <laughs> okay, I threatened that I would give you some virtual resources and here they are. Um, there's a ton of different seed sources for pollinator seed mix. Um, some of the ones we've used in the past have been, or landowners have used in the past, have been Prairie Nursery or Prairie Moon Nursery. They are in the Midwest region. Um, Ernst Conservation Wildflower Farm and Vermont Wildflower are on the East Coast. So they're a more local source of seed mixes. Um, I just threw an example in a Vermont Wildflower Farm, their mixes. They cater specifically to the Northeast. Um, they have a wildflower. They actually have a native wildflower seed mix, which is pretty cool. Um, and they have just multiple different mixes you can choose from. So um, I'll leave you with some more virtual resources. This is our NRCS website, www.usda.gov. And um, more information and brochures on our programs and farming for pollinators and um, different pollinator species can be found there as well. Also, we um, frequently partner with the Xerces Society for invertebrate conservation. Um, they are a leading organization for pollinators and pollinator habitat. And some of the slides in this presentation um, I've utilized of theirs. A lot of them are mine. However, um, it's my photographs, but a lot of the informational slides were theirs. And we have a Xerces partner right here in New Hampshire. Her name is Alina Harris, and we work with her closely as well. Um, anyhow, www.xerces.org um, for more information and handouts um, on pollinator conservation, farming with bees, and for bees um, and natural areas, et cetera. Um, I also wanted to mention very quickly that I've dropped some resources off at the Cook Memorial Library. Um, I've got pollinator posters there for anyone who's interested, anyone who can utilize them anywhere, feel free. Um, there's some of those brochures that I showed you um, that were online as well. Feel free to head on down there and pick up what you need. And if you have any specific requests and you can't find what you're looking for, feel free to contact me. And I just wanted to give everyone a big thank you tonight for joining me um, and taking so much time out of your evening to support pollinators and pollinator conservation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Deb. Um, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions that have come in the chat box and people maybe would also like to um, unmute. There's a, a question from Tim Rich. Tim, I wonder if do you wanna unmute and speak about that or I can read it also. Um, so, The Tim Rich, um, they have a blueberry farm. I'm gonna I'm gonna read it to you. Okay. They have a blueberry farm, and they have in some years rented honeybees, and other years they have not rented bees. And it's been hard to determine whether it makes a difference to the crop yield because there's other factors that affect the crop yield in any given year. They mm -hmm. were once told that the native black flies that they sure don't have to rent are as effective as the imported bees as pollinators. Um, so they're wondering if there's a way to determine whether the investment in renting bees is cost effective. Well, first I would ask, do they have pollinator habitat out there to support native bees? And have they ever planted some and seen a difference that way in pollination and yield. So, 
So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go on to another question. Uh, someone has a one acre field that's grown over with brambles, a northern slope on rocky quote unquote soil. Um, mm -hmm. You have particular ideas for pollinators, for, perhaps from seed in that context. Um, yes, any seed will work. Any pollinator seed will work there. Um, I would start small and test it out, you know. Um, maybe a small plot, clear what you can. Brambles are not good. I would try to get it down to mineral soil. Um, try to clear and then maybe, you know, if you can't rototill, try to somehow rake it out or, um, you know, just get it as, as down to as mineral soil as you possibly can. If solarization is an option, you can do that for a season. Um, and I would test out um, maybe a dry, you know, you could do an, a dry upland mix, which is offered um, on earth seeds. And check out their different types of, of mixes for different soils in different locations. Uh, there's a message from the Blueberry Farm. They don't have pollinator habitat yet, but they might soon after this presentation. <laughs> I think that's great. So here's my answer then after my question back to them. I would try it. I would just, you know, create, go ahead and create a strip along your blueberries or whatnot. You will probably never have to rent hives again. Now, if you like you know, keeping bees for honey, um, I think that's great too. However, they are expensive um, to rent hives for pollination. So um, why not just use a natural source? I think if you plant a, a great pollinator strip somewhere near those blueberries or in and amongst them or on the edge of the field, I think you'd be all set. Do people have other questions? I have a question. Hi, William. Hi, Deborah. Um, yeah, we're struggling with um, things to plant in a shade garden that we have for the pollinator habitat. So yep. we have the pollination habitat garden next to the habitat forest um, that has a power line right in the middle of it, power line area and um, whips are growing. So mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out what the plant in the power line area that would be great for the pollinators. Um, that aren't going to compete with the whips. There is some service berry coming up that's starting to bloom. Um, yeah. But I was wondering, do you have any ideas for other things? And it's sort of shaded. It's not this big open um, power line typically that you see. It's kind of shaded and has about chest level whips. Right, right. Um, I would start again with the seed source. Um, they have specific shade mixes that you can choose and it'll be a mix of a bunch of different species. Right mm -hmm. off the top of my head, um, can you do anything with say hostas? I mean, they, they actually, the flower on a hosta has huge value for bumblebees. Oh, I didn't think, that's funny. I didn't think of that one. And uh, I grow hosta in my backyard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, 60 different species. <laughs> but like I, got... it, 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 Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, sounds like you have a source, too. <laughs> yes, I do. I do. And, you know, it's funny because I don't think of hosta to bring about into an area like that. But, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, it's more it's more wild, I'm sure. But, um, you know, you may struggle with the shade plants. Um, uh, that is one thing. A lot of these seed mixes require full sun. Yeah, OK. Um, I grow three different types of plum trees, the European plums. I grow the green gauge, the yellow um, egg plum, and a wild plum. And it's incredible when they bloom how many of the pollinators gravitate to the, the blooms on that tree. It's unbelievable. It's going to start blooming tomorrow. Now, if I grew one of them by seed mm -hmm. um, and put that in the power light area, could I keep it trimmed down and it still would bloom? Do you know anything about the European plums? I don't. I don't know. I don't know much about them at all. But um, okay. I don't see why not. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just if you kept it trimmed up, you know, it sounds like a good yeah. addition. Or maybe you could put it on yeah. the edge so it's not exactly in the power line. Yeah. Not exactly. Yeah. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you, Deborah. I have Thanks a question. 
Um, yeah. I have a small area we had put in a driveway last year to build our house and we have an area between the driveway and the pine trees that are growing. Um, there was, they were very young trees in this area. They were cut, but the area was not stumped. I'm thinking it's a great area for me to do a planting, but I can't really till it because it wasn't stumped. Is there some way I could do that? And it is next to some pine trees, so it would get some shade. Right, right. So I kind of always like to utilize what's there instead of trying to get rid of it. Um, the stumps, are they rotting? Are they something you could say, you know, you could plant in? I have a bunch of stumps in and around my yard that I have huge plantings and I've just kind of emptied them, excavated the center out and then filled them with soil. They're very and, small. They're very uh, small. This was, this was scrub growth. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could try to scatter seed and see if it comes in and, um, you know, just works its, works its way in, uh, in and around the, the stumps. But um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what would fit that area without seeing it, really. All right. Deb, there's another question here. Um, you showed those pictures of a strip in year one and year two and year three. And then at another point you mentioned mowing every year. Yeah. So there's a question about how you decide or, or how that works. Right. Um, I think that generally it's been my experience. You can go up to like three years and most of your perennial plants will start coming and still, still be hanging on. Um, you know, it depends on the area, depends on the planning. Um, however, by accident, our planning got mowed last year. So I'm interested myself in seeing how it comes. It's coming back this year, actually, right now. And there's still a ton of bee bomb and such like this. Um, but I would say after like three years, if you just want to give it a quick mow over with a raised mower, nothing close to the ground, um, that should keep it cut back and keeps any of the weeds cut back that are, are, are really going to come in and, and take over completely. Um, but again, I think that some of the other um, weeds and some of the other plants and create nice diversity as well. So and, I hope that answers it. If you were going to mow, what time of year would you do that? Um, some people say early in the season to, um, you know, take out the weed population and, and competition. And then I've seen people do it in the fall, too. So, um, yeah, as far as management, that's a, you know, um, a management issue. And, um, and I generally cut all my stuff back in the fall. So you cut it back as if it were a gardener? something. Yes, absolutely. Yep. In the fall, in the fall, late November. So, um, and I had a question too, you could, because you spoke about buckwheat and clover. If yep. you mix those in with pollinator seed, are they too dominant? Are they going to kind of take over before the pollinator seeds can have their process or can they be kind of mixed in? Um, you know, I've seen people seed like forest trails into buckwheat and clover and it takes over the entire thing. So yeah, it's, it's a pretty aggressive, buckwheat is a pretty aggressive um, annual. So, and what happens with that is the flowers, the surface area, no, the, the plant leaves, the surface area, the plant leaf is so large, it will absolutely shade out um, anything else that's involved. So, so yeah, I don't think that I would suggest them to go in together, although what a neat idea, you know, that would be a crazy, crazy pollinator habitat. It'd be really valuable. Do other people have questions they'd like to ask? Lucy? I'm curious, uh, you mentioning that uh, turning stumps into planters. Yes. And so if it's like a big pine and you, and you, I don't know how you hollow it out a little bit, but would the pine, <clears throat> would the pine affect the, the um, acidity of the planting? Absolutely. I'm sure it would. I, I always incorporate my own soil and my own additives, but yeah, it might have to be something that's um, more acid loving that you stick in a pine stump. 
I've got a bunch at the house here that I have maples. Um, we cut down a maple that was hollow and we just sliced it up and sectioned it up and I outlined it around a garden and then planted within those stumps as well. And it kind of um, really worked out well. So I haven't really used a pine, but I've, I've used the hardwoods and, um, you know, root depth is the only restriction, except eventually they grow into the ground. So, and it's a nice, it creates a nice habitat, leaving a stump in place um, with the bark for amphibians and reptiles and moisture is almost never a problem in a stump um, container like that. It really keeps things nice and moist. Mm -hmm. I could ask one more. You bet. What about, um, what about planting on a septic field? Like probably there's seeds that you shouldn't do that with. Yeah, I would say. And I'd kind of, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good one, Lucy. You got me stomped on that. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know of it. I haven't heard of a septic um, pollinator mix um, on any of these websites. <laughs> I might stick with grass on that. It's a good question, though. If I come up with an answer, I'll, I'll let you know. OK. Anyone else have questions tonight? Thank you so much, Deb. Oh, you're welcome, Juno. Thank you so much for having me and a big thanks and shout out to the Cook Memorial Library as well. I appreciate all they've done. Yeah, thank you, Amy and Mary, both of you for, for supporting this. Um, and there'll be, there'll be handouts at the Cook Library and, and I'll send an email with the links from Deb and you know, so you can have live links for those resources. Um, yeah, and really nice to see you all. Plant a lot of pollinator gardens this summer. <laughs> Send us pictures. Thanks, Deb. Thank you. Deb. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Happy planting to everybody. <laughs> Bye, Deb. Bye, Amy. Bye. Bye.